Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. I'm now joined by Professor Gigi Foster, who is the Professor of Economics at the University of New South Wales. Uh, she joins me now from Sydney, Australia via Zoom. And she has a new book on uh, assessing steps uh, taken to curb the COVID pandemic title, Do Lockdowns and Border Closures Serve the Greater Good? Thank you very much, Professor, for joining me uh, and good to see you once again. Professor, earlier on uh, the show, I spoke to with uh, former finance minister of Greece about their dealings with the IMF. Right now, Sri Lanka is in the midst of a full-blown economic crisis. What's your advice to this nation? Well, first of all, it's not about tweaking. Um, you do need significant reforms. And again, I'll point to the political corruption. This helps if you understand that there is such political corruption. You understand that spending more on items that are going to help the entrenched elite secure non-starving uh, class of people in Sri Lanka is not going to help the country as a whole. As you know, the max amount of economics is social welfare as a whole, not just the welfare of the people at the top. So the first thing is to work out how to get more of the money that Sri Lanka does have, which is not much, allocated to the needs of the people who are at the bottom, who have faced the biggest costs due to the decisions made by the elite during this period. So that might, for example, consist of healthcare funding. It might consist of subsidizing food. Uh, it might consist of if you are going to give tax relief, give tax relief on things that the, the poor buy most again, food, perhaps a bit of energy and and try to up the tax rates on people who are wealthier. In relation to your interactions with external overseas bodies that may or may not be willing to give you money or loan you money, I would definitely be playing the humanitarian card uh, state that this crisis has come about because of the madness that took hold of elites around the world, including in the WHO. And then in some sense, it's not just Sri Lanka's fault that it has fallen into this economic sure. catastrophe. It is the fault of the whole world and certainly the fault of the elites that led us there. Um, who basically ignored the information that was known at the time about how costly these lockdowns were likely to be. So in those negotiations, you can you can try to play that card. Um, I also think that you, you do have to look at the broader political sphere and note that India is getting closer to China these days. And of course, I, I saw that you've had some dealings with China in relation to a military base. I'm not sure I'd go in that direction, but certainly cozying up in some way to China as a, a, a hand up, uh, perhaps following a model similar to the charter cities type model, like a Macau kind of situation, where you say maybe give a lease to China or indeed to a Western power, if you wish, of a section, a little region of Sri Lanka and say, yeah. look, in this area, this area is now called Germany or France or Canada or China and give the institutional backing from that existing country to try to lift up the people and businesses in that section and hope that then that spreads throughout the country. It, I mean, you know, what you said was very vital there. Uh, we have to think in a very different way, not the way we have thought for the past uh, 70 odd years, 80 odd years. We have to really think in, in, in a noble way in order to get out of this economic crisis. What you uh, touched um, makes a lot of sense. Closing in uh, to China is something not just politically, but it is also beneficial for the people of this country. Uh, I want to ask you uh, one thing now. You said you need to take care of the, the, the bottom tier of, of, uh, of our society when it comes to this particular economic crisis, giving them relief, uh, uh, certain tax reliefs to certain uh, companies, to certain uh, trades, uh, to make sure that they can continue with their businesses. But the, but the solution what Sri Lanka is opting for is to go to the IMF, uh, get around two point, uh, maximum I think around four billion, um, they, they, they're trying to work out, but I don't think that that'll come through. But, but in that instance, Whenever we go and borrow, they're going to give us certain rules and regulations. So the first thing they will ask is to increase taxes uh, all across the board. Now, we have another tax bill, which is in, uh, in the Supreme Court, where people are arguing a, a, a exuberant amount of pay tax, which people cannot afford right now because food prices are up. Uh, um, cost of services are up. Every single thing, even even a cup of coffee, is really pricey at this moment. But their yeah. income is not up. It it is never, uh, you know, a little bit at all uh, to get a, some kind of relief. Now here we are punching in more taxes on the people. What would that do as we move on? 
it's just going to be punishing. I mean, as you're implying, it's it's punishing, particularly if you don't have a progressive eye on those taxes. If if you're raising taxes on everyone, then that includes the poor. I mean, it is definitely true that we do not, even in the West, get as much in tax receipts from the rich people as we presumably would be due if, in fact, corporations didn't hide their income so much, right? We have a dis dis disappearing kind of tax base problem in the West. This is one of the reasons why digital currency pushes are, are so mm. strong these days. Countries are desperate to find ways that they can get their taxes, you know, tax receipts high, um, high enough to, to fund the expenditures that they have. Um, so so that would be, you know, the, the first thing, of course, that you don't want to do is to raise the taxes on the poor. Um, in, a, in a crisis like this, to be honest, another thing that has worked elsewhere, and I think in Africa, it's, it's uh, something that's being seriously considered, is really try to not be so dependent on these international organizations. Instead, try to develop self-insurance plans. Plans of various informal or formal types at the local level so that you can spread risk across a community, which also strengthens, by the way, that community itself and, and try to weather the storm together so that when individual people are shocked, you know, having a, a bad harvest or bad business income or whatever it is, others in the community can step in and take care and, and you sort of support each other rather than becoming so overly dependent upon these international organizations which are going to control your policies exactly. to a large extent and they may not be in the interests of Sri Lanka. That is absolutely true. This is something that we've been saying on this program constantly because if you go into the IMF, we have to basically bow down to whatever they're saying. If not, we're not going to get uh, anything. I mean, uh, that would make sense if they are going to give us an exuberant amount of money in order to take care of all our debt. But we are just getting somewhere around 2.9 billion when we have uh, a debt ratio of around 50 billion. So that that's a joke. Uh, I don't know uh, how we have to uh, trend our policy. You touched a very important thing, Professor Bish. You said that we have to source it locally. We have to find solutions locally, which is much more important than looking into these international bodies. Uh, is that the only way that will help us to get out of this crisis because right now what Sri Lanka's uh, uh, formula for any issue is let's borrow money, let's borrow more money, let's borrow, continue to borrow money. Now here we are uh, with a, a, a debt bill of around 50 billion dollars. Uh, no, no way, I mean nobody understands how that uh, is in local currency because it's too big even to fathom in our minds to understand this is the amount of debt we have. Uh, pushing towards local solution, how crucial is it right now for Sri Lanka? I think it's one of the, the most positive and nationally affirming things you could do. You know, don't forget that the spirit of the people is very important. It's not just feeding their bellies, but feeding their hearts and their minds. And if they are given a story of strength and national strength, mm. national resilience, um, the ability of people to help each other, it's sort of we have a story in the West called Stone Soup, where each person puts in a small piece of something, a carrot, a turnip, a pea or whatever. And eventually you have a big pot of soup and everybody can yeah. eat it. That kind of inspirational story can be extremely powerful in times of crisis in communities. And and I would also look at what this money is being spent on. I mean, for heaven's sakes, have the public servants take a pay cut. I mean, you don't, yeah. you know, you don't, you don't let the the people who are earning so much money continue to earn that, and with with basically immunity from the the accusations of all of the damage that they have caused, and and how they need to pay some kind of reparations, and without, uh, you know, without actually asking as a country, why are you doing this? Do you care about Sri Lanka? Do you care about our people? If you do, then take a voluntary pay cut of a certain amount and redistribute that to the poor in the form of tax relief, in the form of food subsidies or any other health subsidies, something else that will help people to get through this period of crisis. And in the meantime, of course, you want to try to encourage investment at the local level whenever possible. And as I say, closing to China, trying to think about other ways to, to develop what, what industries you have. And you have some advantages. The high literacy rate, the English language speaking, I mean, it, those are those are not to be sniffed at. Those are yes. important advantages. And so you have, you know, you have some things that can be done, but you have to get out of crisis mode. You have to wrest yourself away from the control of international elites and also your own internal corrupt elite and, and bring power back to the people. You pretty much, uh, Professor, explained the problem. 
and you also give the solution. And that is exactly what our uh, leaders are not doing at the moment. They are they're completely blind to uh, basically simple science, simple common sense, because if there is a dollar crisis, then you need to export. That is the simple solution, but we're not, we're not even going on that route. Um, let's take a short commercial break. I'm in conversation with uh, Professor Gigi Foster, Professor of Economics in the University of New South Wales. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. Uh, I'm in conversation with Professor Gigi Foster, Professor of Economics in the University of New South Wales. Uh, she, she has a new book called um, Do Lockdowns and Border Closures Serve the Greater Good? Well, um, the answer for, here is, uh, for, for us here in Sri Lanka, that has not, because apparently uh, we are in a thick of uh, a, a, an active economic crisis and we are trying to basically apply the same solutions we thought would work and never did in the past. And instead of thinking in a novel uh, a way, we are still going with the old mistakes, uh, old decisions which we have taken in the past uh, 80 odd years, which has brought to us this particular point. So if you do the same thing in the same manner and expect a different result, you know, uh, the uh, you know, you know what will happen will be the one who will get fooled in the end. Professor, I want to ask you about China. Um, China it was a country that has been giving uh, Sri Lanka a lot of support. But in the p uh, past few uh, months, past few years, we've seen there is a, a massive uh, a cold war erupting between the two superpowers. One is the United States from the West, and here we are with China. Sri Lanka has always been a battleground for these two superpowers because China wants uh, Sri Lanka uh, in, with the Belt and Road Initiative and, and they want uh, the Belt and Road Initiative to be successful, whereas the United States do not want that. And it is very evident uh, understanding and, and, and reading about it uh, in the local um, events that's occurring here. So let me ask you, um, you continuously said we need to coast uh, in on China and try to get their assistance and because we do not have other options. We are a victim of this global crisis. That is 100% that is, uh, understood. Right now, uh, Sri Lanka's relations, uh, one of the things where a lot of people are saying Sri Lanka would be influenced by China, which means uh, all our policies and, and, and uh, other matters when it comes to businesses would be influenced by China per se. Is that a fear that we need to entertain at this moment? I think there are other dangers, such as the ones we were speaking of earlier in relation to IMF rules that come together with money that are a little more tangible. China, the Chinese and the, the Communist Party and Xi Jinping, they have certain interests, of course, and they do try to infiltrate uh, in the West and, uh, and change the narrative and control information and things like this. But if you have a strong national culture and character, which Sri Lanka does have, then you have the kind of ammunition or the kind of armor that is required to resist the more, uh, so we say, insidious influences uh, that you might find from the Chinese. And the thing about the Chinese is, yes, they're politically tyrannical, but economically, notwithstanding the latest notions of including, including the sort of uh, Chinese sphere only and not being so open that Xi Jinping has given at the latest Congress, it is the case that they are market oriented. And so the Chinese, as we were saying earlier in the break, will come with money. They come with a desire to do business. They are educated. They will, um, you know, work hard. And those are things that can help Sri Lanka. <laughs> so, exactly. you know, I mean, I'm Western. And so in some sense, you know, with this block to block um, political dynamic that's been developing, I should be barracking for the West. And so I should say, well, Absolutely. you know, the Sri Lanka comes to the US. But what's good for Sri Lanka, I think, is actually to be more aligned with China, also because India is becoming, you know, even more aligned with China and, and China, Russia, India, 
Sri Lanka would belong in that group um, for its own interests right now, economically and probably politically as well. And again, in the medium term, this can all be adjusted. It's not that you're making a you know a commitment in blood uh, necessarily with the Chinese, but um, certainly in the, in the short run, I think it's a it's an obvious thing to to, to pursue, and you shouldn't be too worried about cultural inf infiltration. Sure. Sri Lanka is a strong country, and that should be part of your narrative. Uh, Professor, w one more thing. There is a conversation uh, locally where we've been talking about the fact that, yes, we are going to the IMF just to ask around $2.9 billion, but why don't we go to China and get a bigger amount? Getting a handout from either party, is that a solution right now? I, I wouldn't see handouts as the, as the best way to go. It really is more JVs, joint ventures, um, partnership proje projects of various sorts. There is opportunity in Sri Lanka. Um, we were speaking earlier of your advantages. I mean, you had incredible tourism in input, you know, and in inflows before the COVID pandemic hit. Get that going again. Um, you know, get the get the other industries that have gotten hit by COVID back on their feet. And how do you do that? Well, if you're poor and bankrupt, you can't do it as easily on your own. So find partners who are willing and who see the economic opportunity. The Chinese do. So that, that they seem like an obvious partner. There's one more thing I'll mention as a possible longer term solution and it's something that I've talked about here for the West. And I think it could potentially work in Sri Lanka. One of the problems you have with corruption that we were speaking of earlier is that there is a very strong link between money and, um, and sort of power and the allocation of resources to people. And if you could break that link between politics and resource allocation, you could get resource how, allocation how? that was more in line with the needs of the people. How do you do that? Well, you stop having political appointments to the heads of bureaucracies. Instead, you have citizen juries, juries of citizens themselves that are convened to appoint the heads of various bureaucracies, such as those associated with education or infrastructure or, or agriculture or whatnot. And that would help to reduce the political incentives of the people heading those bureaucracies so that their decisions are more in line with the needs of the people as a whole. So that's one idea maybe for the medium term. Indeed, indeed. Uh, that's actually a valuable idea because uh, corruption is something that we've been talking about uh, in this country and, and, and that is something every person is attributing uh, to right now with regard to the current crisis. They say the economic crisis is a result of corruption that has been occurring for, for a very long period of time. I want to get your attention uh, back into the book that you uh, wrote, uh, Do Lockdowns and Border Closures Serve the Greater Good. Uh, what exactly did you learn, Professor, in terms of analyzing what was going around these closures of borders, uh, lockdowns, uh, shutdowns, uh, asking people to get into their homes and not move around and, and in, you know, live in a very uh, uncomfortable manner uh, during a pandemic. Because I'm asking that question, we know monkeypox is also getting some kind of recognition all around the world. Uh, we even had our case uh, recently. So uh, are we going, or should we, or, or are we going to react the same way we did with regard to COVID? Oh, well, goodness, I certainly hope not. It's <laughs> one of the reasons I wrote that book was to try to convince everybody that lockdowns are just a bad policy and should be left on the shelf. We find in that book, is, which is an expansion of an initial draft cost benefit analysis I did for the Victorian Parliament back in August 2020, that lockdowns carried costs which were easily 68 times the value of the plausible benefits. And that's being generous to lockdowns. And this is in Australia. Other studies from around the world that have looked at the costs versus the benefits of lockdowns have uniformly found that the lockdowns are far more costly than they possibly can deliver in benefits. And so we should not be opting for lockdowns. The main cost of lockdowns, if you're interested, is that when the GDP slows up, as it has, and you see that in Sri Lanka, of course, then tax receipts fall, public expenditure falls, not just now, but in the future. And that then carries costs of economic value, but economics is about life. Economics is about mm -hmm. livelihood, support of health, support of happiness and thriving of humans. So it is really about what we all want as people. We want to live in a thriving, healthy, secure environment. And we get that when our economies are allowed to operate and our governments are able to spend on things like education, health, infrastructure, and everything else that we spend on, which prolongs and promotes quality of life. And so that's the biggest item, the biggest ex expenditure item, the cost item of a lockdown. The second biggest cost is when you lock people in their homes, they get very sad, <laughs> as you could imagine. They get they get uh, distressed mentally, their mental health declines, their physical health declines, they lose motivation. We saw that happening uh, in exuberant uh, levels. They hurt people. 
people. Of course you saw it happen, and that should count. Just as much as a COVID death or a COVID sufferer should count, so should the people who have suffered under our policies during this period. Professor, uh, one more thing. Um, with Sri Lanka trying to figure out how to get out of this mess, uh, we know that COVID-19 uh, was not the last pandemic that this world will ever see. We will definitely come with new uh, viruses and w new, new pandemics that might threaten the way we live. Now, this is where we need actual information, knowledge, uh, which is vital, not just for the people of certain countries, but for its leaders so that they are basing their decisions on right science, not, not these uh, pseudoscience that, that keeps popping up because, um, I don't know, um, I, I'm sure you, you've been following like um, Dr. Anthony Fauci uh, from the United States who been like once said, do not wear masks, suddenly he changes into, no, 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 you have to wear masks. Nobody knows exactly, instead of saying, no, we do not know right now, let us figure it out and come back to you and be honest with people. We've been doing this ad hoc, uh, uh, um, you know, solutions to a problem which we never understood properly. Uh, right now, there is a lot of information in the public space. There is a lot of uh, information uh, that our leaders can attribute to and take. Uh, what do you see the trend as we move on world over, in regionally, even in uh, Asia-Pacific region? Uh, where do you see the political thinking, the societal thinking is moving to as we uh, go ahead, uh, you know, passing COVID? Well, I definitely think that the, there are cracks developing in the standard narrative and the kind of inconsistencies you just spoke of there with respect to Anthony Fauci are being found in the pronouncements of many people during this period. And what now you see very strongly in the West, at least, is a, a scurrying away of the people who were in charge during this period in an attempt to memory hole the whole thing, right? Put it all into, a, into an amnesiac sort of space in the brain yeah. and say, well, we didn't know, let's just move together, right? That's just not going to fly in a lot of countries because people have experienced so much loss, so much pain at the hands of these people at the top, the elites who were making decisions, as you say, based on a mono vision and of this notion that this is the only way you can think it's the only way we could possibly solve this problem, mm. which was just nuts. I mean, there was suppression yeah. of all sorts of dissenting and alternative views, which we could have adopted in, in certain cases in relation to how to combat COVID and, and whether or not we you know we should actually push the vaccine to everybody and all these other kinds of policy decisions but they were just ignored so what i think will happen is that there will be an attempt by people who are empowered during this period to cover their tracks to get away as yeah. quickly as possible not to face justice i think after a few years we are going to see and it will depend really how quickly this comes, it will depend on how bad the vaccine side effects uh, end up being, honestly, and how, way, how well we can get out of this economic sure. trough that we're in. But we'll see some kind of attempt at justice. And that'll be within countries, within regions, probably community-based retribution, sort of like the reconciliation and, and truth commissions of South Africa after apartheid. That's a model that I think we could probably learn from. Uh, absolutely, Professor. Um, the thing is, uh, common sense needs to dictate uh, the conversation rather than all these uh, bogus policies, uh, which we do not know will work or not, because being honest about it would be the only way then, then people will have the ability, because we were told vaccines are the best thing that actually came out from modern science in, into this prop, uh, issue of COVID-19. We don't know the repercussions of it. Uh, how you correctly pointed out about that as well. Uh, one more thing, uh, Professor. Finally, I want to ask you uh, for Sri Lanka per se. Um, what is the most crucial thing we have to be focusing on right now? There is a possible health crisis. There is a possible, uh, you know, other global affairs that might impact us. But right now, uh, economically, what should people of Sri Lanka forget about the leaders, but the people of Sri Lanka should do? feed each other, help each other, be there for each other, be strong for each other. Um, as much as you can, invest in your communities, figure out ways to get through this crisis period, and believe in yourselves. Do not allow divisive ideologies to um, tear you apart and weaken you further. Um, and believe that there is a brighter day around the corner. Absolutely, absolutely. We are hoping for that as well. Um, Professor Gigi Foster uh, from the Professor, uh, who, who is the Professor of Economics at the University of New South Wales, who joined me from Sydney. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. It's always good to talk to you because 
uh, I always get a different uh, take on, on the matter and, and having different viewpoints is the way forward instead of having a, a one-dimensional conversation which will not get us anywhere. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much for being so candid and open about this.